Morning, Southside. I'd like to give a special greeting to any visitors who might be with us this morning worshiping. We're grateful to have you with us. I would also like to say happy Mother's Day. I know we live in a culture that has downgraded this high calling that God has designed for moms. And so this morning, just by the grace of God and the Word of God, we just want to encourage your souls with what a high calling God has given to you. I know we have many new moms uh, coming in the next few months, and so uh, what a gift, what a, what a high calling. And so we pray for you, and um, we just want you to feel our hearts for how joyful we are uh, at the calling that God has given to you and our appreciation. Uh, Mom, I'll never be able to thank you enough for your impact in my life. So to God be the glory. Um, before I begin, I'm going to ask my brother to come forward. We had our prayer group this morning, and it was just spirit-filled and really a rich time. Uh, and so I asked uh, my brother if he would just come pray for the moms. Um, so Levi is going to come up. So guys, he's going to use this mic. If you're not led by the Spirit and throw a few change-ups, it's not really church. So <laughs> you come lead us, brother. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking this morning while we were praying about my mom and her faith, and I really think that the grace that I've received in my life from God is, is largely due to her decades of, of prayer and her, her trust in Him. And so just thinking about my own mom, my wife, and she had a tough week potty training this week. And so, um, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. But <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, just pray with me. Oh, Father, thank you so much uh, for your grace. God, thank you so much for all the means of grace that you use in our lives to help us know you um, and to bless us. And God, to lead us home. And God, thank you so much for giving us mothers. God, thank you for this picture of the gospel and these people who give up their bodies and their lives and their time, and they do it often so thanklessly um, without recognition, and, and they give their whole lives to it. So God, thank you for this picture of the gospel and this picture of the love of Christ. We live by faith in something we cannot see in the cross and the empty grave, but God, thank you for giving us these pictures of the love of Christ in our, our moms and our mothers. And God, thank you for all the mothers that are here. And God, please, please encourage their hearts. Oh, God, please pour out your love into their hearts. And, and God, strengthen and encourage them and give them patient endurance. And please help them um, press on towards the kingdom and, and labor, knowing that in the Lord it is not in vain. May your spirit please help them receive that truth and, and, and believe it. God, please give them all grace to, to point our children to Christ. God, that they would know you. That we could all celebrate in the kingdom. together. So please help them long for that day and hope for it. Be strengthened. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Sweet to see a man who wants to go to an unreached people group and tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ and he gives glory to a faithful mother who went to the throne of grace praying for him all of his days. To God be the glory. Well, this morning, if you'll turn to Philippians 1, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Paul says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, 
having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these words. I pray this morning now that your spirit would teach us the meaning of them, that we would comprehend them in such a way that it would be the full knowledge that you give through your spirit. I pray that this would be the the blessing of every mom this morning, Lord, that children would rise up who live out these words. Lord, here's our charter, here's our mandate as parents, here's our mandate as children of God. I pray, Lord, that holiness would abound in this body, that you would use this this morning to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Let no, no one go through the motions this morning, including the preacher. God, let this be worship, and let us have eyes to see and understand these words. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Chapter one, we're calling the fellowship of the gospel. And we are journeying through that. Our first point in verses three through eight, Paul says as a church, we're to put the fellowship of of the gospel at the center of our relationships with one another. The gospel has taken up our heart. It's what we hope in, we love, we treasure, and we, we fellowship in it together. We share in it. We seek to advance it together as a body. This morning now, we're going to take up verses 9 through 11, and Paul says we're to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of our prayer life. The priorities of the gospel are to be at the center of our prayer life. So this morning, we're going to have a little primer on prayer, and it's my desire that our prayer lives would would grow and deepen even this hour. That what we would see, uh, it would be like a camera lens focusing on how God wants us to pray. These three verses have clicked for me and they've opened up much in my heart and life. They're life-giving words for sure. And I want to start maybe with just some observations from our text. First observation is that a heart then that we've been studying, taken up with the gospel will put at the center of your prayer life then, very simply, the gospel. If that's what your heart's taken up in, that's what your prayers will go towards. We'll put it at the center of our lives. And what is at the center of your life will be at the center of what you pray for. Your prayer life can and does reveal much about your heart. It's a great barometer to measure what are the priorities of your life Well, you will see by what you pray for. And so what I observe then is that when the gospel is not at the center of your fellowship and the center of your prayer and your aspirations and your service, uh, it will not be at the center of your heart. And what will happen is you'll become focused on the scene. You'll be using God for how I can just live into the scene. You'll be temporal. You want immediate fixes. You want to grow up like a weed instead of an oak tree. Quick and easy fixes are where we will go. And what will make me the most comfortable, not what will make me the most holy. What, what I want, not, not versus what I need. And I'm going to move toward ease all of my days instead of needs and sacrifice. Your time with believers will be temporal talk. Your prayers will be centered on the temporal. Uh, your will versus God's will. Your aspirations will be to put tent stakes down in Denver, Colorado. You'll seek to build your own kingdom and your own securities, and you'll call it Christianity. And so what I want to do with you this morning is to hold up your prayer life and what is at the center of it. How should we be praying? And this prayer this morning from the Apostle Paul, led by the Spirit, is a prayer of revival. Prayer is where we see the power of God that will be dispensed upon his children. This prayer could bring down the power of God to make us into what Paul is praying for the church at Philippi. I'm praying it for every one of you and myself this morning. May God come down and cause that in our lives. I'm afraid if all our prayers for this week were answered, we would have no trials. Everyone would be healthy. We'd be sitting around with full bank accounts and perfect jobs, sipping tea, singing kumbaya. And that is not how the kingdom of God gets advanced. I was reading in Acts where God said to his servant, he said, I am going to show Paul how much he needs to suffer for the gospel. Don't miss then what I'm saying. I pray for healing of this body. I pray for jobs and all of those things. 
but not at the center. At the center of our prayers is to be this prayer this morning. This is what I want for me and what I want for you. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And that's what Paul is praying for for the church at Philippi. So come with me to verse nine. And this I pray. And as we begin, I just, I wanna stop here for a second and ask the question, I hope you ask this question, why is Paul praying and why is he recording his prayer? Why is he writing down his prayer? It's obviously not Matthew 6 where they would say these prayers to be noticed. That's not what Paul's doing, but he's bringing us in to the deeper inner workings of his heart before God. What could you ask for more? Paul is bringing you into the recesses of his heart to show you how he prays for the church. So why record it, right? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you three answers. I think it matters. Why record it? To show one that God is the primary and the first cause of sanctification. I don't want anyone in the church to miss this. Last week, for he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He will finish it. We tend to get this with our justification. If you're visiting, justification is when God, when we believe in Jesus and God puts all the merit and the work of Jesus Christ to your account and the judge of the universe looks at you now with all your sins paid for, the righteousness of Jesus wrapped around you and he says, you are not guilty before God. And that is all of God's doing. We bring nothing to the event except an empty hand. We come by faith and we look only to the work of Christ. You you do not add one iota to that work. And then we move into what's called sanctification, where God now takes a believer and begins to grow you and make you holy. And now I'm a part of this. And in fact, I'm more than just a part of it. We start to think it depends on me. And so we, we go from justification, I bring nothing, to sanctification, it's all dependent on me, and that's where you're going to get in trouble. I have to work hard and be diligent, yes. But as we are going to see in this book, it is God who's at work in you, to both to will and to do his good pleasure. He is the primary cause, hear this, the primary cause of you growing in holiness. The reason you are growing is because of God. He began the good work and he'll complete it. And in verses three through four, I thank my God and every remembrance of you because of the way you're growing in the gospel. So I don't thank you, I thank God. He's the one doing it. And so I pray that you get this, it is God who's working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's why Paul began, I pray grace and peace to you because that is what's gonna grow you and sanctify you in grace. So I say he does begin a good work and he'll complete it and then go to God and pray right after he says that. And so what I want you to see then is that God uses prayer to bring about verse six. So verse six, God will do the work, but Paul's now going in prayer, asking God to do a very specific work in the people. So prayer, um, it doesn't change the will of God. It allows you to participate in it. Prayer empowers us to do God's will. And so I look to God for everything that I seek to do for his name's sake all day long. I'm just so convinced, apart from him, I can do nothing, and through Christ, I can do all things. And so it's amazing to me how much this letter deals with the balance of God as the first cause, and then my human responsibility responding in faithfulness to his promptings and to his power, and it's just this razor's edge that God wants us to walk, but it matters that he's the primary cause in my sanctification and that empowers me in my human responsibility. I've got to get, they're not equal. One is primary and one is secondary and yet both are necessary in our growth in Christ. So if you're visiting and, or you've been here even 20 years, you're saying, what is this guy talking about? Um, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I just, I'm going to pray that we get it like Paul's saying. And the second thought In my mind, why are you writing this out, Paul? Well, he prays to show the church that you should pursue after these things. So one, it's God who's going to cause this. Second, you are to pursue these things. Philippians 1.6 does not take away your human responsibility, but it gives wings to it. 
Shouldn't we just pray to God and sit back and, and let him do it? Just let go and let God, the popular phrase in the 80s. I like it, except this prayer is so rich with human pursuit and human effort. Paul's going to say, I want you to pursue love. I want you to pursue knowledge and discernment. I want you to pursue whatever is excellent. I want you to pursue sincerity and blamelessness. I want you to pursue righteousness, and I want you to pursue God's glory just in these verses. So we're asking God for his grace to finish the work that he began in us and to give us grace to pursue conformity to Christ and the works of righteousness. God, empower me to go hard after conformity to Jesus. I want fruit that will remain that Jesus prayed for in John 15. So pursue with all of your heart what only God can bring to pass, depending on him for all of it. That's our razor's edge that we must walk. And then thirdly, I think he prays this to show us how do we pursue these things. So what jumps out at me right away in these verses, it's not a list of eight things, but there are divine connections of how these fruits are going to come about. I think it was a commentator or a preacher. He said, this is logic on fire. And so there is a flow in this passage, and we are going to kind of dig in and look at it. So God will do it, but this is how you partner with God and what he's doing in your life. It's so rich. So come with me this morning and let's come look at the logic of Paul filled with the Holy Spirit teaching us how this holiness and conformity of life will come about. So we're going to look at four aspects of how to pray for an excellent church, for an excellent church. So look with me in verse 9, and this I pray What's that, Paul? That your love may abound still more and more. The granddaddy of them all. As Christ is the foundation of all of the Christian life, love to him is our foundation to build a godly life. You can't build without this. I pray that your love would abound more and more. That is at the core of what the gospel produces in a heart. This gospel breaks in. He takes the heart of stone. He gives you a new heart, and it loves Christ. And the prayer of the believer is more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. We've been born again to a living hope to love Christ. And Paul, Peter said, though you don't see him, you, you love him. You love the Christ. You've been born again in love. And since love is the fulfillment of the whole law, Paul says, I pray that you would abound in it still more and more. And I'll pray this till I die for my life and your life. I pray that you would abound in love more and more and more. If this gospel isn't producing that, you haven't been joined to the vine. So I pray that. This is my constant prayer for my own heart that's prone to be loveless and for yours. What will it look like as God perfects the work that he has begun in you in Philippians 1, 6? What's going to look like more love to thee, O Christ, and a producing more love to others from the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so a cold, loveless heart is nothing to be content with. Don't sit there smiling, feeling okay with that this morning. It's not natural. Many, people, many, many people's love will grow cold in the end days, said Jesus but not ours. We go to the God who began a good work in us and he's faithful to complete it. And so I pray God that our love would abound still more and more in this end days where lovelessness is all over. Are you going to be conformed to this world or will you keep abounding in love? Oh God, make us abound. We give him no rest in this. God, let love abound more and more. I pray. I've seen so many times that Paul never starts with doing. He always starts with knowing. And knowing this gospel produces love. Spiritual change is more of a consequence of what our hearts love than of what our hands do. And so I pray this transformation is a heart that's growing and abounding more and more. This prayer is a call to a God-glorifying kind of life a life of excellence, a life that will rise above mediocrity, carnality, and worldliness in the self-life. Oh God, cause us to rise above that. 
So what is the fountainhead of a God-glorifying life? It's an abounding, I want you to hear this, an abounding, enlightened love. Your life must be advancing in two areas according to this prayer. It's advancing in love and it's advancing in knowledge. And so the two are gonna go together. Um, I, I've got two examples, see if it helps. Uh, it's that time of year, fertilizer. Put fertilizer down, I was reading it, a 50 pound bag, it has 98% inert and 2% of active ingredients and they work together hopefully to make your, green, your grass green. And the 98% of these inert ingredients, I'm gonna call knowledge, and the 2% love, and when these two come together, they're gonna to make you abound in love more and more. Uh, if that didn't work, how about a big ship? A big ship, I want you to come into this massive boiler room, and you walk in, and, and, and I'm gonna call that love. The whole ship is gonna be driven by love, and then you come and you look at all the navigational equipment for how to lead this ship, and we're gonna call that knowledge. So love is, is this power that's driving us, and, and knowledge is the navigational equipment, so we're not just running around being love people that don't have any discernment to our love is where Paul's gonna pray this morning. So this is the foundational grace to live the Christian life. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So to be loveless is to be Christless. It's a foundational grace. We're born again into it. It must be the atmospheric grace of the Christian life. It separates the Pharisee from the Christian is when he puts love in that heart. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. The Philippians have shown Paul the most love, he said, of any church. The furnaces of love, though, cannot burn hot enough. They're, they're sacrificing, they're sending Epaphroditus, and he's saying, I pray that your love would abound still more and more. You never get content. Let it overflow the banks. The word for abound, may abound, is a present tense verb. I just pray that love would just keep abounding in your life. The Greek word means to exceed, to surpass, to overflow with. I just pray that love would go over the banks of your life. Same word where Paul prayed in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you'll have all sufficiency in everything. You may have an abundance for every good deed, this overflowing abundance of grace. He prayed in Ephesians 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, According to the riches of his grace, here's our word, which he lavished upon us. His grace that is just overflowing and pouring over our lives this morning. More and more, pray this for one another. And moms, pray this for your children. I don't think there could be a greater exhortation to any mother. Is let love abound and overflow toward your children and that God would do that work in your children. And I'll tell you this as a, as a pastor, uh, the amount of love that I watch overflow on a weekly basis in this body, uh, I just, it overwhelms me. And I pray that it would just overflow more and more as we behold the overflow of the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is the chief grace. And I'm glad Paul didn't stop there because many do. Love is not all that matters. There is more that must be linked to this love. And so without the next step, you're gonna be a ship without a compass, a rocket without guidance, or a pop bottle rocket without a stick. I remember as a kid, we used to cut the sticks off and light them, and it just, you didn't know where it was gonna go, and that's a picture of someone running around with love and no knowledge. <laughs> love must be guided. Love is excellent but it must be informed and it must be insightful and it must be defined by God. Does not the world have love, but it's perverted. It's all attached to the things that are destined for destruction. They love what they should hate and they hate what they should love. They say it can't be wrong if it feels right. The world loves love as long as they can define it. And so they, they like this term love. And they can agree with us. And they, if you run around with just love without knowledge, they're going to be happy with that. But Paul prays, no, I want your love to be informed by the author of it. 
This love is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's not, I don't study, I just love. You're going to see that these two things are married by God. And so there's two things then that must guide our love. And if you look in verse 9, it's in, the first one is in real knowledge. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more <coughs> in real knowledge. A term that we're pretty familiar with, it's epi. Gnosis, gnosis is knowledge. Epi is this full knowledge. So what I want you to see as we begin, it's not just knowledge. And there's just so many that think it's just knowledge. And if I got enough knowledge, I've I've got it all figured out. And it's not, that's not what's gonna guide your love. In fact, sometimes knowledge can make you some of the most unloving people that there are. So it's more than knowledge. It's epinosis. It's a full knowledge. One, one interpretation is it's a true knowledge. What one comes to know and appropriate through faith in Jesus Christ. When God says, let there be light, epinosis. You now see the glory of God in the face of Christ. You get this. It's no longer just cold, distant, academic facts. You're born again. I get this. Epinosis. Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. This epigenosis, I pray that the spirit would give you this knowledge because no one can get it on their own. You can study books till the cows come home and you can't get epignosis. The spirit of God is the only one who can give this to you where it becomes real and alive and you see the face of Christ. Paul wrote this in Colossians 2 that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, our passage, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in an epinosis, a true knowledge of God's mystery. You, you get the mystery of what he's done in Jesus Christ now. You, you see it, you understand it, the full knowledge. That is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And when you see Christ and you, the Spirit opens it up, everything clicks. And now you see it. Listen to this one. Brethren, Paul says, My heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I bear witness, and this is the Jews he's talking about, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with epinosis. They, they, they have a zeal for God, but they don't get it. And, and how do they not get it? Paul says, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. So God says, you got to be righteous. And they're looking at the law and they're saying, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it. And he's saying, don't you know, in the next verse, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So epinosis is when you realize the Christian life is not climbing a moral standard trying to get your way into heaven by keeping the law. When you finally realize, I can't keep the law, but Jesus did. And when I see that he kept it in my place and by faith, he'll put that to my account. That's epinosis when you're finally overtaken with I'm accepted by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not my own. It's not academic. It comes into your heart. I'm just before God. I'm wrapped in his righteousness. I get it. It's overtaken me. I cannot believe that God accepts me on the merit of Jesus Christ instead of my own. Epinosis. So do you see that you can have a perfect systematic theology and not have epinosis. You can learn Greek and Hebrew and you can dot every I of your doctrine and cross every T. And if you don't have love, you have nothing. Epigenosis produces love to Christ. How do I know if I have it? You, You love Christ. It'll change you. Knowledge is not salvation. It puffs up. Epinosis, when you see the glory of God in the face of Christ, it edifies. God fill us with epinosis this morning. I pray that no one in this room will die with just knowledge. And no one will die just doing good things. But that you die with more love to thee, O Christ, epinosis. It's my prayer for every one of you, and I'll fight for that till I die.
My love must be guided by true knowledge. And it must be guided by all discernment. And discernment is this ability to apply this full knowledge of epinosis to daily life. It's a depth of insight by learning the word of God. D.A. Carson said it's a moral perception of life's experience. You, you now have discernment, the eyes of Christ, as you look at life and understand it. And how should I respond? And how should I think? How should I pray? I'm getting discernment. And I'm just going to call this wisdom, the ability to, to think about how to live in a way that we're going to journey that pleases God and is excellent. Knowledge and discernment, then, are coming into the heart, and it causes love to abound. So knowledge and discernment do not stifle love, but they ensure its purity and its value. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So Paul prays that we would abound in an intelligent and enlightened love. The Word of God is not contradictory to a growing love. They're, they're married. So do you see how this all ties together? I think back to Romans 12. Therefore, by the mercies of God, which I'm going to call love to God in Christ Jesus, the gospel, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And so now we are renewing our minds in the truth, the epinosis, the full knowledge of this gospel, and you're going to learn how to, in our next uh, point, how to test and approve what is excellent. So look in verse 10 for our second point. So that you may approve the things that are excellent. So this kind of love that we're looking at, it, it now with, with epinosis and discernment, it can uh, test what's excellent. And this word is dokimazo, and it referred to sticking metal in a furnace and boiling off impurities. So what came out is this approved gold, this purified gold. And he's saying, we're to be doing that with our minds. So by the truth of God's word, it's purifying, it's renewing our minds. And we can now, uh, in Romans 12 too, that you may prove what the will of God is. You're learning what is God's will for my life? How do I respond this way? You're, 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 you're learning. This is what's excellent by the knowledge of the word of God. So the discerning love has an ability to test and approve the things that are excellent, to judge what is vital in life, to make a proper assessment about what really matters in light of eternity, what is essential, what is best. These, these are the best people. What should I be devoted to? What should be secondary? How should I live this day for my God? What should I focus on? What should I concentrate on? Devote myself to, give my energies to. This is the ability to put things into perspective in a way to please God, to live with an eternal perspective, to have the mind of Christ. Uh, later in Philippians, I think he summed it up well. Uh, Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, what is ever of good repute, and if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. To live a life of excellence to your God, this increasing, discerning, and enlightened love causes me to live a life of excellence. Love to God and others. Give me the ability to look at life and live this life that he's talking about. An unbeliever is a life wrapped up in trifles. They live their whole day holding on to vanities. And the Christian life has a purpose. Their lives, we live knowing that we're going to stand before God on the last day and give an account. An informed love can focus this life. Your life will show what you love. And so we have a discerning love. We, we know we're growing. And how do I love this person? Sometimes it's not to put an arm around them. It's to give them a, a, a nudge in the back. And so we're, we're praying, God, give me the discernment to know, is, is this someone to, to comfort or to encourage? How, how do I love this person in this situation? We're, we're growing to live excellent lives so that our love is more informed and more taught. Isn't that a beautiful thing to be growing in how to really love one another? If you love your reputation, you'll neglect your wife, your kids, and you'll be a hypocrite to build up your name. 
Love is a natural conforming principle. And so the question is, what do you love? Get your love right and your priorities will be right. You'll approve the things that are excellent. In fact, I'm just going to give you an example. Look at Philippians 1.21. We can't wait to get to that verse. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain as he's waiting to whether he'll be executed or not. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I don't know which to choose. But I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to part and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So do you see this working out of excellence is, I would much rather go be with Christ. I hope they cut my head off because I'll go be with Christ. Uh, to die is gain because I'll have more of Christ. So he's, he's thinking that way. And yet, if I remain on, I'll be able to labor for the growing and the increasing of your joy and your faith. And so here's this beautiful uh, discernment and excellence as he would look at life and appraise it. Philippians 3, 7, he says, all the things that once meant something to me, my religion and my self-righteousness, I now count as manure compared to the surpassing values of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He now could approve the things that were excellent, the gospel, having a righteousness not done by the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. So this love keeps me from getting distracted. Christianity is full of activity, but not the best things. And so we want to be growing in a abounding, overflowing love that discerns how to love. And something that just jumped out at me was Martha. We, we, we know that story so well with Martha and Mary, and, and they're all, uh, Martha's putting a meal together, and Mary's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his instruction. Um, and, and she's busy, Martha, but she didn't lack love. She's just not approving the best thing. Why Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and she chose the best thing, the excellent thing. And so I pray that we would grow in choosing the excellent thing of sitting at the feet of Christ. And I just think of who's our best example, but Jesus. He had more demands on him than anyone. And he, he cried out, I must be about my father's business. That's excellence. So we need to grow in our love to discern and approve what is best. Don Carson, again, he, he asked, what do you do with your time? How much time do you spend nurturing your wife and your children? How much time do you spend witnessing to your neighbors? How much time do you spend exercising and in personal relaxation? Are your reading habits committed to what is best? Do you take time for personal prayer and reading? Do you attend the prayer meetings? How do you decide what to do with your money? Has your compassion deepened or are you becoming cynical? And he's asking these questions. Are you growing and approving what is excellence in your life? Do you see what Paul is praying for? Not just stockpiled information, but that you would have the ability to prove what is excellent in life and in death. And that's my prayer for all of us. Third point, he gives a hint of clause. And he says, in order that you might be sincere and blameless. And so it's not just an intellectual exercise. I want you to see we approve and we learn what's excellent, but Paul's purpose in this is transparent purity and, and utter blamelessness, a life full of righteousness. We've looked at this word a while back, so I won't park on it, but sincere, it, it, it had this idea of being tested by sunlight when they would put wax in, a, in holes in a vase and you could hold it up to see if it was the real deal. And so what he's saying is, is as we journey this, you're going to become real. You're not going to be fake. You're not going to be a hypocrite and artificial. You seek to be real before your God and not wear a mask. And you'll become blameless, void of offense, with a clear conscience above reproach. Philippians 3, verse 11. Philippians 3, 11. I just want to give you a picture of this real quick. Paul says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. So I'm not perfect. So what do you do, Paul? I press on so that I might lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. 
And I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, perfection, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. So the, the, what I'm getting at is you're to pursue what you are. And, and so what I want you to see is this is not perfection. He just said that. So what does it mean to be blameless and sincere and yet not be perfect? And so I, I, think, I think it was Piper gave three reasons to kind of examine what he means by that. And one is you confess sin. You, you, you don't make peace with it. You make war with sin. And so I'm not perfect, but I'm not going to make a peace treaty with sin. I'm going to fight it. I won't coddle it. Secondly, you're to actively pursue holiness that we're seeing in this passage. And Paul's saying, I press on. And in verse 12, he says, as we do it, we trust Christ to be our sinless perfection. And so we are pressing on as those who are already perfect in Christ Jesus and are loved and accepted by God. And we're to do this, he says, until the day of Christ, until with a view to the day when the spotless one will return. And he says, I'm coming to a pure Christ and I wanna be a pure and chaste virgin on that day when he returns. Revelation 19 says the bride has made herself pure because of an abounding love and knowledge and approving the things that are excellent. Our aim is to become like our bridegroom. We, I'm doing eight weddings in the next two months. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking a lot about this. A bride, a bride, um, not, not many here, but some, and I don't have a problem if you do it, a tanning booth they, that you're going to walk down. It's your big day. It's winter maybe. And, and I'm going to sit in the tanning booth. I want to get my skin, you know, not Irish looking. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do my nails, my hair. I'm going to spend three house payments on a dress and all this effort. Why? To be beautiful for her bridegroom on her wedding day. And I just see Philippians 1 here. I want to be beautiful for the bridegroom when he comes back. That's what we're praying for. That's what Paul's praying for in this passage. In light of that day, I want to be holy. And I want to be growing in it. I want to be like Christ. That's the definition of beauty. I want to approve the things that are excellent. I just want to be like him when he comes. When that trump resounds, I want to be ready. I want to have oil in my lamp and be prepared. If he came back today, are you ready or would you shrink back? Philippians 1 is a prayer that we'll be ready. And I don't know why the church of God is throwing out the pursuit of holiness in our land. Because the Bible knows nothing of it. Let's be diligent and pursue after this. Come back to... Verse 11, we'll finish up here. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So I want you, I'm, I'm gonna give you a break because I spent three months on John 15. Um, if, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So Paul's now saying this person is gonna be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And you remember what Jesus said, the one who abides, your fruit is gonna come and it's gonna remain. It's gonna be the real thing. It's not artificial. It's not wax fruit. You're gonna bear this fruit for the kingdom of God that will remain. And it comes, he says, how do we get this fruit of righteousness? I want you to see it real clear in verse 11. It comes through Jesus Christ and we're right back to a vine and a branch. The only way this kind of life that I'm talking about this morning, it comes by abiding in Christ. It comes by faith and resting and delighting in the vine. It's not a work. It's taken this gospel and I believe it. And I believe that Christ is a full Christ and everything now is available to me through this gospel. We're a vine and a branch and I draw all my resource from him and he's going to bear this fruit of righteousness in my life. So we're right back to ab abiding. And this is what's going to come. It's going to make love overflow the banks. Remember he said, just as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. 
And when we abide in that, love's going to overflow your banks. And you're going to be having real epinosis. Epinosis, if I had to define it, it's you abide in Christ because you see who he is and, and all of his fullness and what is available to us in Christ. I get it. It all just circles around and comes back to the fullness of Christ. And then the climax of Paul's prayer. It's a progressive prayer. It's moving forward and upward. And now it lands on the Mount Everest of Revelation to the glory and praise of God. Why does this matter so much to me that we be conformed and our love overflow is that it will bring God glory and praise when his bride looks like this. Here is our highest motive. This is why we want our love to abound, that our lives might bring glory and praise to God. This is the core of our existence. This is why all things exist. This is how all of eternity will end and what will be forever. This is the essence of parenting. Your kid is not the center of the universe. God is. And I want to teach them and I want to show them and, and train them in this. Again, Don Carson said that the pursuit of excellence can become idolatrous. And so this is the, the balancer as we close. I, I know people that your whole pursuit of excellence is nothing but idolatry and self-righteousness. A perfectionist can be the most self-absorbed person. A preacher can pursue trying to be a better preacher for self. A student can only want A pluses for self. You can have a house that you make so pristine that nobody can live in it. Or a church where you have fellowships with only silver plates and only the best cooks. We do use the best cooks. <laughs> what we call excellence is not driven by love and knowledge and discernment or the glory of God. It's the glory of man. I heard I, there was a school that, they, there's a Christian school, and they said, we're only going to pursue excellence here in Colorado. And they just went after everything excellent. And their definition of excellence was rich and big. And then they got caught cheating and recruiting athletes. Our goal is not to worship excellence. Our goal is to worship God. And we pursue after these things for the glory of God alone. True love seeks God's interests and others. If our pursuit of excellence is bound up in our own egos and our own self-fulfillment, it's worthless. Throw that down this morning. To the degree that our pursuits are what is excellent is increasingly impelled by discerning love and directed to his glory, then we are in line with the Apostle Paul in his prayer this morning. So I want you to hold up your prayer life to God. Do you put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life? Hold up your life. What does your life make people think about God this morning? May God grant revival to this church by growing an enlightened love that we approve what is excellent. We live in an ever-increasing conformity to Christ. We wait for his return through his power for the Father's glory and praise. So I pray that you pray this for yourself. You pray it for each other. And I just, I'm gonna close out by praying it for our moms. Austin, Claire, Lise back there, or they leave? Oh, Austin and Claire Lisa are waving to you all if you want to look back there. Wave one more time. Praise God. They're in the middle of chemotherapy and getting a big answer tomorrow whether they move into a stem cell transplant. And they just wanted to be here on Mother's Day and worship with us. And so I want to pray for them. And then I'm going to pray for the moms and we'll close out. Father, this I pray for Austin and Claire Lise. I pray in this trial that their love would abound still more and more, God, that I watch them more concerned 
about sharing with a homeless lady than about their cancer that day. God, let love just keep overflowing those borders. And I pray that epinosis that you've given to them, Lord, the beauty and the glory of Christ, that you keep teaching them your word and give them discernment for how to think about this trial and how to journey their cancer and their kids and their baby. I just, God, I pray, give them this, this discernment of how to live during these days. Let them approve the things that are excellent of how to live and, and show forth your glory, witnessing to those on the cancer ward and all that you're doing, God. Thank you for the excellent things that are coming out of this sweet couple. I pray, Lord, let them be sincere and blameless, be, be boiling off impurities and unbelief and things that have come out through this trial. God, make it pure and let them not grow weary until the day of Christ. Strengthen them in their weariness and their tiredness of this trial. God, fill them with the fruit of righteousness as they abide in Christ. They can't do this trial. Let them look to Jesus who wants to give them strength and sufficiency and joy and peace and comfort. Jesus, be that to them. My peace, I give you. My peace, I leave. I pray, God, that you would give them that and that by this trial, you would get all the glory for the sweet couple who are loving and trusting you. I pray the same for the Tijerinas, God. I pray for our moms. God, let their love abound and overflow to their children. I know it gets hard and it gets irritating even. God, I pray that agape would flood their home, that they would testify of their mother's love when they grow up. God, I pray, give these moms just epinosis. Let them see the glory and the beauty of Christ. Let this gospel get them out of bed and encourage them. Give them discernment. God, to know the best way to train these little ones and the right answers and the right balances and the right teaching. Please, Lord, give our moms discernment. Let them approve all day long what is excellent and to train these little ones to one day learn how to choose the most excellent things in life, that they would be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. I pray for holy children for these mamas, God, and that they would be filled with the fruits of righteousness as they abide in Christ, as they know their own strength cannot do what you've called them to do. Let them realize their branches and let them draw from a vine that is infinite, His promises are sure. God, let Christ be the center of all their joy and their delight and their pursuit. Lord, and let abundant fruit hang on the limbs from this. And I pray that you would get all the glory for these children. God, let them not grow weary in this high, beautiful calling. Lord, I pray for any of their children who are, are prodigals. I pray before you right now, God, that you would draw them back, that that overflowing love that they learned and saw in their homes would make them long for the Christ who produced it. God, pour out salvation on every lost child in this body. God, thank you for Mother's Day. Thank you for these moms. Thank you for my own. Thank you for a wife who I watched parent in such beauty. I pray, let her feel honored and loved. And every mom in here, God, what a we have some amazing moms, and to you be the glory for all of it. Let, let this be a, a group that is aliens and strangers whose citizenship is in heaven, and that moms laying down their lives and teaching children would just be uh, adorned in this dark and dying world. God, use these children to point others to Jesus Christ. And we pray for all of this, that you would get the glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.